Welcome to the afternoon session of Molasai HPC workshop. Uh, my name is Murat Keçeli. I will be chairing the session. Uh, we had very nice talks and presentations in the morning session, and we will have four great talks in the afternoon as well. Uh, so the format is like 25 minutes of talks, five minutes Q&A, uh, and we will have two talks, and we will then have a short break, and then we will um, finalize with two other talks. So, and uh, to ask questions, you can use either the uh, Zoom chat feature or the you can select the reactions and raise hand, um, whatever you prefer. So without further ado, I would like to introduce uh, Ed Valev. Uh, so he'll be giving the first talk for today. Thank you, Ed, for accepting the invitation and the floor is yours. Well, thank you guys for uh, the invitation. Um, very happy to be here. Um, and even uh, supposed to be a, I guess, science slash computation workshop. I'll primarily talk about really computation uh, today. Uh, this is probably the first time I'm going to talk about this topic, but uh, something I'm very excited about. So I figured, why not? And this is a perfect audience. So I'll tell you about some uh, collaborative work uh, with computer scientists and computational scientists um, on a uh, new programming model. Uh, that I think uh, potentially has a lot to offer for certain types of applications. If this is general purpose programming model, uh, and you could program um, uh, general programs in it, um, a strength that are specific uh, to certain types of programs. All right, so that's the big picture. What I'll talk about is a task centric programming model for irregular. HPC applications don't have to be HPC. You could use this for workflow, uh, really for anything that is task centric. Um, but the goal is to uh, provide an implementation that is um, as efficient as possible and also addresses uh, the needs of uh, HPC resources. Um, so that's the tablet, uh, template. Uh, that's the programming model that discuss. Um, and it provides tasking in distributed memory environment uh, as a C++ library. Um, we're working hard on heterogeneous support as well. Uh, it's an open source project, uh, NSF funded, um, and you can uh, check it out on GitHub. The introduction to TTG is described uh, in a paper at an SC workshop uh, from last year. Um, uh, the first performance data that I'll discuss um, is in a, um, will appear in an IPDPS paper that just got accepted. All right, so first, why tasks? Um, it's probably to a lot of you, it's um, natural. Um, you've seen, you know, you've heard the word task, task, task-based programming and so on. Uh, but really it's useful to think about why, what does it buy you? Why are we talking about task-based programming? Uh, first, uh, to me at least, uh, from big picture, it, you essentially decouple uh, the schedule of the program from the statement of the program. So you describe um, what you do, uh, but you don't necessarily specify when you do it. Uh, you can potentially apply constraints on when certain things happen uh, in a particular sequence, but allows you eventually, uh, from the composition standpoint, to decouple what from when. And so instead of writing a for loop where a counter goes in a particular direction, instead you say for each in a range, and then in principle that range can be traversed in order or even in parallel. So a lot to remove the decisions on scheduling from your responsibility uh, allows you to potentially improve code reuse and so on. Uh, certainly, if on the uh, then on the runtime side, uh, there is more opportunity to optimize schedule, uh, to maximize con concurrency, or optimize in general for resource utilization, and then minimize latency by overlapping computation with communication and so on. Uh, for some programs, it's a natural way, um, and really they are implemented um, um, in a particular, well, you could say task-based way. Um, Functional languages, if you if you really look into how the uh, runtime, what the runtime actually does, um, eventually uh, you, you can think of this as um, it basically has a task based backend. But uh, lots of uh, programs that where you have to deal with latency, 
uh, can be naturally expressed in terms of tasks and so on. And effectively, the, the way we program accelerators, it's all task focused. Um, CUDA, HIP, and SICL, they all, the model is you essentially have a, a pool of streams, which think of them as essentially logical threads of execution, and you fire tasks into them. And then you fire them, but they don't complete until later in time. Okay, so an example, um, I thought about what's, what would be an easy one. And since I'll talk about uh, Koleski later on, um, I thought I'd introduce it here. So the, even though you've, even if you've never seen um, um, sort of a pseudocode for Koleski, uh, bottom line is composed of four types of operations. And there is sort of a wavefront like uh, structure to the algorithm. So you there's an outer loop and then there are a couple inner loops and then there's the third most loop. So this is a cubic algorithm for dense matrix and so on. The details don't matter, but bottom line is if uh, in practice, the way it's implemented and let's say scalar pack um, is gonna be uh, implemented in terms of operations on blocks of a matrix rather than on each, each individual element. And so, um, on the right side, what we see is a particular uh, instances of tasks that will be created when you run this on a uh, matrix that is blocked five blocks by five blocks. Okay, so you see that indeed a uh, structure of a program ends up being some sort of a graph described as a graph. So essentially here, for example, the nodes here on this DAG directed a cycle graph, uh, these correspond to the statements in the program right uh, so you have five of them because they, they only apply to the um, diagonal elements of this matrix. One, two, three, four, five. Okay. But what uh, rewriting this program in terms of uh, tasks allows us to do is gives us an opportunity to uh, explore, um, well, first of all, extract parallelism out of this because, for example, TRSM 4, 0, 1, 0, 2, 0, 3, 0. Um, can be all uh, executed in parallel. They depend on the same input. Once the out output from PTRF0 is computed, then these nodes can be executed in parallel and so on. So basically uh, the runtime can in principle extract more parallel and also on a parallel machine, the runtime by uh, orchestrating data movement and computation can uh, overlap them and so on, okay. So as you see, even for a simple problem, uh, this graph is fairly large. You can imagine that for realistic problems, these things potentially can be uh, far too large uh, to instantiate at any given time. All right, specific for TTG apps. Uh, so the app that I'm showing you here, even though we're going to use TTG to um, assess its performance, uh, this is a regular in, in a sense that the static, that the DAG structure is static. Uh, once I tell you it's a five by five block matrix, uh, then I could um, basically construct this DAG a priori given the algorithm. What happens if you want to implement things like pivoting, for example? So those are the examples of data dependent graphs. And in general, uh, they're going to be irregular. So especially whenever we, we talk about pivoting or sparsity or things like this, whenever we actually need to know the data, the actual data that the algorithm operates on in order to be able to construct the DAG, then we're talking about something that is difficult uh, to in general model and execute. So examples would be data dependent recursion. You know, One example is going to be an adaptive refinement of reconstruction of some functions and some spectral element basis or data dependent iteration in the case of let's say sparse matrix multiply, both of them are gonna be uh, gonna appear later. Unfortunately, constructing irregular apps um, and in general, really, in my opinion, uh, even regular apps using task-based, well, um, using task-based decomposition is difficult. Most tasking models focus primarily on control flow um, there are some that are data centric, but they essentially assume that everyone will want to deal with mutable data. Um, some will, uh, most will only support concurrent tasking on a single node, think OpenMP, uh, CUDA and so on. Uh, and, and the distributed memory ones assume replicated uh, knowledge of state, which is difficult with data dependent computation since you're discovering that knowledge as you're computing. And so 
it's difficult, again, in, in data-dependent irregular apps uh, to use the current models. All right, so TTG is a product of a collaboration, as I mentioned, it's NSF supported. In second round, um, through an ACI program, uh, and essentially at the end of the previous project period, we came up with a prototype for this, this model uh, once we realized what actually the solution to our needs was going to be. And this is, a, as I mentioned, collaboration with computer scientists, George Silk and Thomas Soro, um, and Robert Harrison, um, who's computational scientist slash chemist. Um, he and I essentially bring in two different uh, driving applications. One is the hierarchical tensors uh, that appear in the um, uh, multi-resolution calculus, uh, integral differential calculus. And I'm particularly interested in uh, computational block uh, and rank sparse uh, tensors. All right, so um, the motivation for TTG came from trying to extend the run times that uh, these essentially three stakeholders in this project brought together. One is Parsec and the other one is Madness. And I wanted to outline what they are and what they're capable of in order to motivate why TTG was even needed. So Parsec has been around for rough, roughly 10 years. It was primarily uh, invented as a custom task scheduler for the next generation of Scala Pack. At the time it was called D-Plasma. Um, now, D-Plasma has become replaced by what is known as Slate, which is an exascale computing project, uh, li <clears throat> exascale linear algebra package developed by Dungar Group. Parsec was developed uh, with the idea that uh, essentially um, high quality implementation needed to be able to uh, deal with distributed data structures and also fine grain tasking. Uh, it's defined as generic framework for architect. I actually don't remember what Parsec stands for. Uh, something parallel, I think. Um, the actually early version was kind of cute. It was DAGU, uh, the, the French word, so DAG appeared in it. And so it's DAG centric. Um, uh, it, it's essentially several things. Um, uh, ultimately, I call it a task runtime, but it also comes with a set of programming models on top of it. So there's a really low level task runtime. You're not supposed to interact with it directly. And then there are, you interact with it through programming models. One is very low level called dynamic task discovery, which is essentially the lowest level of, here's a task, Instant, insert this task into this task pool, um, and it will get executed at some point. And then there is the higher level parameterized task graph. And remember, this was developed for linear algebra. So essentially there is a, a language that's developed and essentially ideally suited for developing linear algebra applications for writing scalar pack in it. Uh, and um, that language is called parameterized task. Well, the language is called something else, but the model is called parameterized task graph, uh, where you describe task structure uh, at a high level. Instead of individually inserting tasks, you essentially state what the DAG is going to look like. And with static DAGs, it works perfectly. The problem is that, uh, as I mentioned, PTG is awesome and super powerful, but it really only is focused on DAGs with static structures. So data dependence is difficult. The pivoting was difficult for them. And DTD is essentially an unscalable due to the challenge that I mentioned before, why MPI and PCAS models are not so good, um, is that uh, with dynamic, well, with data dependence, you essentially need to replicate uh, the DAG, knowledge of the DAG, uh, on each rank. So unlike in PTG, where you have very compact description of the DAG and it's available on every node, and you can essentially analyze the DAG on every node. Um, in DTD, you're discovering knowledge and then you need to replicate it essentially in order to be able to schedule on every node. Um, and that's difficult to do. So essentially it's, it, it's a non-scalable interface. PTG is scalable, but it does not deal with dependence. Uh, madness is, uh, also a runtime, although it's more than, than that, it's been around for a long time, 18 years. Um, there are some more recent runs actually that have features similar to uh, Madness, specifically DPC plus, uh, sorry, um, UPC plus plus and HPX. Um, so Madness is really a bunch of applications. The same brand is used to describe science and runtime. Uh, so uh, it's uh, really, uh, package for adaptive multi-resolution calculus uh, of particular structure uh, and its applications in chemistry and physics. 
but it's implemented in terms of low level component I call mad world, which is basically a madness runtime. Uh, it's basically a mishmash of parallel programming techniques. It's multi-paradigm. It's not just one thing. It's got message passing, it's got threads, PGAS, distributed tasking, distributed actors, so sort of com-like models and so on. Now, the key programming model, uh, and that's the one that in our group we use is a futures-based composition of data flow data. And that's similar to what HPX and UPC++ recently um, have also developed, although they don't cover all features. So they don't, for example, have the um, remote features. Uh, but now the NWKMEX is also starting to, um, you know, sort of partially motivated by the use of tiled array. Uh, to become AX. I just wanted to mention what tiled array is to those of you who are not aware. It's basically the generic sparse distributed memory tensor framework. Um, primarily focuses on blockers uh, tensors. You could implement element uh, sparse tensors, but um, you would have to do some work. Um, it's very generic. Uh, example, you can implement the tensorial data structure. For example, we're to implement nested tensors, tensors of tensors, if you will, uh, would then become EX team in order to implement these cluster methods. It's got Python API, CUDA backend, and other backends are uh, being developed. Is, is, is there already? Um, uh, what we really needed TTG for, really an easier way to compose algorithms. Uh, so writing, composing applications using this runtime is difficult. And the same thing is going to be hold for similar runtimes like HPX and UPC++ is, is composing algorithms at the level of futures is difficult. Uh, easier way, we need an easier way to transform optimized code. So I could walk, you know, I could talk to you in more detail about how, we, for, for example, uh, optimize for uh, minim, minimizing permutations and uh, trying to minimize number of copies and so on. All of that is done manually. So. And so on. So, and, and we also need easier way to manage resources on devices. So really, futures-based programming is a very low-level affair, similar to DTD in, uh, in Parsec. And there are many missing features in optimization. So enter TTG. Um, it's a template task graph uh, model. As I said, it's been described. So uh, for more details, please go there. I'll just give you a big overview. So the basic programming model is very simple. Uh, the idea is the same of PTG, except we're trying to make it more general. Essentially, we take a graph like this, and we're trying to come up with a compact, uh, maximally compact representation of it uh, as a graph of uh, structure uh, that allows to in encapsulate all the structure of the big graph. So for Koleski, something like this, um, we essentially have four types of nodes on the Koleski. As I mentioned, there are four different operations. So those become nodes on the template task graph. Each type of a node on DAG becomes a single node on uh, TTG. Uh, so it's characterized, uh, each task is gonna be characterized by the type and then also unique ID. So these different nodes of yellow color on the POTR of DAG they essentially are instances of the same task template given on the right side by this POTRF node, um, instantiated with a different ID, different ID being coordinate in the matrix. Uh, node in TTG therefore is encodes a task type, and then it has input terminals and output terminals, uh, and it can have zero or more inputs and output terminals. Uh, terminals connect uh, to other terminals via edges, and these edges carry data uh, that is tagged by ID. So whenever a node receives, uh, whenever a node on TTG receives a data um, datum for every input terminal that it has, in case of POTRF, there is only one. Once it receives the data for the same ID on every input terminal of that task, that triggers task instantiation, okay? So once we, for example, here, we read the A00, it enters here, and that instance is POTRF zero and so on. This proceeds by uh, going around. Notice that every terminal can have multiple inputs and every terminal can have um, uh, outputs going to multiple directions, okay? 
so that's a fairly general model. Notice how much more compact the uh, TTG is, and that's the that's the idea. Okay. Um, so uh, now let's talk a little bit about implementation. So as I mentioned, it's a C++ library. Uh, it requires C++ 17. Um, unfortunately, the code is going to look fairly verbose because it's C++, it's general purpose, and it's not, um, if you compare it to, for example, the specialized language for PTG in Parsec, it's more verbose than that, but it's general purpose, and that, that is a nice thing. We maximally leverage the type uh, system of C++, uh, so it's a strongly typed um, library, so terminal types and code types of ID and data, so for example, example, when you misconnect things, you typically get a, a compile time error. Um, we also use the type system to align co copies and uh, send and broadcast, and that's efficient. That's the important thing for uh, maximizing efficiency. So we want to avoid extra copies, extra memory allocations, and so on. Uh, this is distributed memory capable uh, because it sits on top of two um, uh, distributed memory runtimes, both Madness and Parsec uh, allow you to transfer data. But in order to transfer user data, you, user has to specialize or specify how to serialize the data. And we support multiple uh, trend, well, serialization mechanisms. And Boost is a standard one, and Madness is a custom version of it. Um, I would recommend Boost probably for all purposes. Unless your data is trivial, then we just use bitwise copy. Uh, the new development in this uh, IPDPS paper is that we now support RMA data transfers, which turns out to be, again, a massive uh, improvement for some applications. Now, all of this can be introduced non-intrusively, so it's nice if you have some custom uh, code that, you know, custom data types that you don't control, uh, you can describe how to serialize them uh, non-intrusively. Um, it abstracts underlying runtime. As I mentioned, there are two runtimes that it sits on. Uh, Parsec is the primary target of ours, and we uh, spend most of the efforts optimizing uh, the backends uh, on Parsec. Uh, but in principle, the programs are written without knowledge of the backend. So as long as you don't use any backend specific features, the pure TTG program can be used with either. And the only thing you change is you flip a macro and it will go to Parsec or Mad World. The model uh, in principle um, is simple enough where we can certainly envision being able to take standard C++ threads into it or HPX or UPC++ and so on. Uh, it supports control flow, data flow, so various types of uh, graph, graph flow, flow graph programming. Uh, all of them are supported. Um, ideally, the best way to program is to have pure data flow. Uh, but in principle, tasks can have side effects, as, as you'll see in a second. Um, uh, let's not worry about the uh, programmable terminals yet. Let's consider the example. So a typical example uh, in a task-based uh, setting, Google, you know, OpenMP tutorial, and one of them is going to be probably Fibonacci or something like this. So that will highlight the ability to do recursive tasking. Of course, recursive tasking is a, uh, uh, in the Fibonacci case is uh, basically uh, an extremely inefficient way of computing Fibonacci since it basically replicates work. So, and here we can also do the same thing, except now we make it data dependent. So let's do it slightly more complicated. This is an example where you compute some of Fibonacci numbers less than N. Okay, so this is totally not, far less trivial. We, we cannot put in an uh, argument and then say, compute, uh, Fibonacci number, um, the nth Fibonacci number. Now here we want to compute some of Fibonacci numbers up to a certain number. Uh, in this case, it's a thousand, and I don't remember how many, it's uh, less than 20, uh, but I could change that number and then I wouldn't, wouldn't remember or know the answer. So what does the program look like? Essentially, we're trying to describe a graph that looks like this on the right side. Uh, we essentially have a, a single node that describes the Fibonacci recursion. Uh, and then we have a single node that receives the output. Um, because it's computing a sum, we're computing, actually, this node is going to receive multiple contributions. So uh, we're going to have essentially a stream of Fibonacci numbers coming in and want to reduce them. And so that's one thing that I did not mention from the previous slide is that we can actually have programmable uh, input terminals uh, that can add things together. Um, 
Bottom line is we have some uh, lambda that we wrap uh, to form a body of this. Uh, inside of the body of that function, we, we're able to send the data to the two input term, uh, output terminals. And the way we'll wire the terminals together is by uh, essentially having these edge objects that connect things uh, together. So for example, this, oops, uh, here the, we're using F2F edge as uh, a way to wire the uh, uh, input as an input for Fibonacci for the first input. Um, and then we also use it for the output as well. Then there's the print and so on. This, this is actually the uh, actual um, uh, unit test in the program. And then you've described the program, you make it executable, then you invoke it. In this case, I invoke it by essentially sending a couple inputs uh, to at the very beginning. And then I fence, I wait for the result. And then as part of the fence, uh, the, once this task executes, uh, it will check the reference answer, 2583. Okay. All right, so let's look at quickly at performance. I'm essentially uh, out of time. I just wanted to highlight that um, uh, the high level composition in, in this strange form actually allows us to specify very fairly complicated algorithms fairly compactly, but due to uh, the quality of implementation, actually the performance that we get out of it is competitive with state of the art. Okay, so essentially we have our cake and eat it too. So this, the first example is again, not data dependence, it's dense block Koleski, uh, but that's the standard one considering that um, more than half of our team are um, people from ICL, from the University of Tennessee, okay? So linear algebra is gonna be the first thing we tested. Uh, and so we did dense Koleski. This is a um, test uh, done at uh, Stuttgart Supercomputing Center. Um, these are 64 core nodes, AMD EPIC, I don't remember the model, um, up to 256 nodes. Uh, this is weak scaling um, because this, well, Koleski is known not to be a particularly great candidate for strong scaling. Nevertheless, as you see, the performance on node is, uh, is very good and it's maintained. So the red is our best TTG. Um, Slate is the ECP version um, of Scalar Pack. The native scalar pack, for whatever reason, the ECP scalar pack is not does not perform as well, uh, potentially because they probably traded off uh, CPU performance with the GPU. Uh, D plasma actually is uh, performs as well. For some reason, we don't understand that uh, with smaller block sizes, we actually outperform D plasma by a significant amount. Uh, so there is still more work uh, to to learn, but um, performance here is competitive. And this is the um, uh, performance for a fixed number of nodes with changing problem size. And again, uh, we, we come out on top as well. All right, uh, this is another type of an algorithm. Again, not data dependent, but um, sort of a paradigm of uh, matrix-like computation. Here we take adjacency matrix and we run so-called floyd warshall algorithm. So uh, computing shortest paths uh, between every pair of nodes on a graph. Um, and again, TTG comes out on top. Uh, the only issue here is that for some technical reasons, we're not able to take the uh, smallest tile um, um, case and extend it to the largest number of nodes uh, due to some technical issues. And so MPI-based implementation was able to beat us. But until then, we're beating it by significant amount. So um, certainly higher efficiency than a manual MPI plus X implementation. Uh, this is a block sparse matrix multiply, similar story here, uh, except eventually at the end, we run out of uh, work because we're implementing an inferior algorithm to the state of the art, which is the DBCSR library from um, Eda Hazurik. Uh, but until then, we're um, competitive with it. Um, and at the end, this is an MRA benchmark, again, computing um, MRA re representation of some 400 randomly placed Gaussians. And our objective is to beat the state-of-the-art implementation madness, which we do. Um, the scaling eventually, the, the strong scaling is not particularly great, uh, but certainly um, uh, this is not the latest uh, data that we have. And certainly we have some uh, room to improve here uh, as far as load balancing and so on. So what TTG can offer, just to summarize, high-level composition, um, and not just for shared memory, 
Uh, I didn't talk about too much of shared memory. We have some task benchmarks, um, actually comparing it to things like OpenMP. And, and actually, you can uh, um, outperform OpenMP on shared memory uh, as well. Uh, there is definitely an entry barrier because the programs end up looking very different. They're more declarative than procedural. Uh, nevertheless, the benefits, in my opinion, for you know, HPC codes can outweigh uh, the, uh, the struggle. Uh, the back end is highly efficient. As I mentioned, there's lower task overhead than comparable alternatives. Uh, and in principle, all your favorite backends could be put into this. So don't consider this as sort of threatening your favorite backend. Uh, this is an abstraction on top of it. Uh, eventually, it will become heterogeneous soon, hopefully. A data flow into device, though, is hard. That's what's slowing the progress. Um, would be cleaner with compiler language, but um, uh, we are living in real world, not an ideal world. So C++ uh, is probably the best way to uh, make it adopt. Please check it out. It's on GitHub, as I mentioned. And I just want to thank my collaborators for funding and uh, you for your attention. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Ed. Uh, now, I think we have time for one question, maybe. Uh, are there any questions? Okay, I, I have actually one quick question. At, um, is there any way, well, maybe this is too abstract for that, but uh, for tasks that are the same, is there any caching capability implemented on top of it? Tasks that are the same? Yeah. Um, so the model, every task is supposed to be unique. We don't have currently the support for running the same workload multiple times through, um, through the same DAG. Uh, part of the reason for that is, um, it's difficult to ensure correctness of the program for that model. So essentially a correct program is supposed to instantiate every task once. Uh, these task IDs are supposed to be unique. Um, in the case of a streaming inputs, in principle, we can, you can think of them as micro tasks that are associated with every time a, a message comes in. But um, again, what gets, what the task runtime receives is, is gonna be a single task of, with, with, with a given ID. So we don't support um, um, tasks that are, um, sort of identical. Uh, we do support the uh, important case of control flow where the tags are empty, the void tasks. So the control flow, essentially imagine you just get rid of IDs and, and you, you just run uh, with void, uh, void tags. So we definitely do support that. And in that case, you basically have one task again, so. Okay, yeah, thank you. 